The Kansas City Chiefs with a blockbuster trade dealing Tyreek Hill to the Miami Dolphins. What does that do for Kansas City and their draft? They got two first round picks now. Also, Rob Ranks joining us as always today for our Thursday episode. And we're going to get into what he feels about the Philadelphia Eagles. They got some draft plans as well and some pro days. Reason we're going to get into all that and more right here on Locked On NFL Draft. Let's go. You are Locked On NFL Draft, your daily podcast covering the NFL Draft. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of the Locked On NFL Draft Show. I'm your host, former NFL and NFL defensive back, Eric Crocker, and of course, as always, joined by my co-host, Ryan Tracy from Rogue Analytics, and he's going to have a link later for y'all, specifically for you, you draft nerds. You're going to love it. Also, we have Rob Rain to here with us joining us today, uh, one of the hosts of the uh, Locked On Seahawks, all right, the enemy of the San Francisco 49ers, but we all know that, but we're getting into it, man. We got some good stuff going on, and I mean, Kansas City, this is right up Ryan's wheelhouse. So, first, I want to know your initial thoughts. I mean, getting rid of a receiver who has been so dominant, uh, so explosive. I don't want to say he's single handedly responsible for what's going on with Patrick Mahomes and his trajectory in the NFL. Looks like he's already going to be one of the greats, but he's had a huge hand in it. All right, now he he's gone. So, one, I want to know what does that do for Kansas City and their offense, and two, how the hell do you replace him? It, it changes things for certain because it has been a triumvirate. It's, it's a three-man triangle between Travis Kelsey, Tyreek, and Patrick Mahomes. I, I don't think you could see as much progression and success for Patrick in his first few seasons if it wasn't for Tyreek being there, to tell you the truth. I will say this. It is impossible to replace the man because he's not just a deep threat. His change of direction is electrifying and honestly unstoppable. Go ask the Dallas Cowboys. There are a lot of plays that you can go point to about how he attacks. I don't think there's any one player, certainly in this draft, but maybe not in the league that has that combination of athleticism and has learned to develop route running. He was, he was pretty raw when he came out, so he was never a finished product. There are players in this draft that you could project to if they got on that same path could get there, but it's going to take probably at least two players to replace Tyreek Hill. You know, there is a guy who I don't want to say he's responsible for the development of Tyreek Hill, but he's worked like really closely with two guys. One guy, Tyreek Hill, right after his rookie year, Tyreek Hill reached out to him and said, hey, I want to improve my game. I want to be a better overall receiver and be more well-rounded. And he also works with Devontae Adams. And if you heard Devontae Adams when he was introduced to the Raiders, Adams talked about how, hey, this guy, he recruited me to Fresno State. He got me there. He's been in my ear. He helped me through the process when I was struggling with grades. And he's really been a big-time mentor to him. And that's Dub Williams. And I know all about Keith Williams, uh, Keith Dub Williams, because he's from Stockton, California, where I'm from. But he <laughs> has really helped. I know, right? We even went to the same high school. He has helped uh, Tyreek Hill a lot. You know, you see the start and stop. You talked about the change of direction. Truly understanding how to run routes with more controlled speed. A lot of that came through uh, the work of Dell Williams. So, uh, yeah, big stuff right there for Tyreek Hill. Uh, uh, Rob, I want to know what were your initial thoughts when you saw this blockbuster trade go down? Because it, it was kind of out of left field for me. I, I didn't even know that this was even something that was going to be a possibility before you saw the reports that, Hey, the Jets and the Dolphins were kind of fighting for Tyreek Hill. That's the thing. I, I had a very similar feeling as what I thought from a Seattle Seahawk perspective when they traded Russell Wilson. And it was, what are you kidding me? I'm like, are, are these are some of the elite players in the NFL? And when you get these kind of guys, you don't trade them. But that that is 2022 in in the NFL. The salary cap just commands all. I mean, Russell Wilson is going to be commanding something very close to 50 million dollars per year. Tyreek Hill is going to be 30 million dollars per year. I mean, gentlemen, refresh my memory. How many games do they play in the NFL? <laughs> I mean, I just couldn't believe it when when you hear these types of numbers. But 
you know, at the same time, that's that's just the reality uh, of the game that we are now competing against. And and I I like to look at it like I I remember the very very first time I saw Tyreek Hill as a member of the Oklahoma State Cowboys going against the Florida State Seminoles, and and Florida State was Florida State. I mean, and and there's just back in the day. I mean, that was a team that was just so loaded with athletes. And I saw one guy playing for the Oklahoma State Cowboys, who was the fastest guy, most explosive guy on the field. And I thought, who the heck is that? And that was Tyreek Hill, and and he had his his off field issues, which led to his transfer. Um, you know, and, and why he wound up going in the fifth round, as Ryan mentioned before, but. At the same time, you just saw a guy who was such an explosive athlete. So I agree with Ryan 100%. There is not somebody that Seattle or, the, excuse me, the Kansas City is going to be able to draft <laughs> in, in the first or second round of this year's draft class who's going to be able to replicate what what uh, the, the Tyreek Hill was able to provide the Kansas City Chiefs. I think if you are looking for the closest representative of that as far as the first round guy, Chris Olave has similar straight line speed he is not as physical as tyreek that's the mm-hmm. thing you see a lot of guys who can run but they aren't tough they, they can't take a hit and actually you know do something with the ball and tyreek hill is a complete package he truly is a well uh you know kind of branded and, and well um described player when he says cheetah because cheetahs aren't just fast they're quick they're they're agile they're tough and, and that's exactly what he is and, and so i i'm very curious to see what the Kansas City Chiefs are going to be able to do with their draft picks. Because I think that they got they got paid as the Seattle Seahawks did with Russell Wilson. I think that they got you know quality um, you know draft capital in in compensation for their elite athlete. As long as you hit on your draft picks, if you don't, then it's it's easy to say that you just gave away one of the great players in in you know in our, our our current NFL because the Seahawks did that with Russell Wilson and they might be able to bounce back. The Chiefs did that with Tyree Tyreek Hill. They might be able to bounce back. And that to me is one of the fascinating conversations about the 2022 NFL draft. Is there are guys out there, but can the Chiefs and the Seahawks as we talked about before, can they actually duplicate what they already had in their own wheelhouse? I think it's crazy because the top two receivers in this league right now, in Devontae and Tyreek Hill, and maybe I'm a little biased in saying number two, both of them moved teams this year. Both of them traded. Both of them represented by Drew Rosenhaus. This is now the Rosenhaus offseason. I refuse to call it anything else. And I will tell you this, for the Chiefs to recover – they have a wide receiver core that's like this with Tyreek at the top, McCall Hardwin in the middle, and a big question mark at W3, right? You got to get here. You got to raise your other players because you're not going to have anything like your wide receiver one anymore. So can you make a core out of it that allows you the diversity in terms of spacing on the field to combat some too high that they've seen? This makes it, I think, harder if they can hit on those draft picks to take away their offense like we saw last season. Do they force – Anything at t- uh, 29 or pick 30 and just go receiver there? And, and if so, who's who's the guy that you're thinking about? Because there is a receiver I really like now. I don't know if he's going to be there, but Jason Williams, who's dealing with an ACL injury out of Alabama. I mean, if you want some explosiveness, a guy that's terrific run after catch, I would think that that would be an offense he could flourish with. And I know he might start the season on the pup list, but at some point he will return. And I think a team like the Kansas City Chiefs can kind of withhold that with Miko Harden. He's been there for a few years now with Juju Smith. And obviously Travis Kelsey has the number one pass uh, uh, target hog there. I think there's an opportunity for Jameson Williams to kind of be able to slowly get into his and learn his role and then be able to explode as the season goes on and really be an impact player come postseason. Do you think that that's something that they might do, a, a direction they might lean in? I think today they could. I think yesterday they could not. But having back-to-back picks at 29 and 30, you now have what I deem as a luxury to take someone like like Williams or like David Ajabo, guys that you will not have on the, the field, in my opinion, for the first half of the season. That is the safety net. The question becomes for me, I like the the fit for Williamson as well. The, the fans have already jumped on it, so the, the fan base will be happy with it because he's not just the deep threat. We've seen him work behind the line of scrimmage. We've seen him do the dirty work, cover kicks, the whole nine yards, right? So I like the fit, even though he's not as dynamic in changing direction as Tyreek Hill. Nobody is. That's fine. The question becomes is how clean are the medicals? And if they're too clean, 
Do they even have a shot? Because if not, I think the phones have already started ringing. I think they're talking to the Jets, who they just got done trying to make a trade with. Now they're talking picks. And I think they're probably talking to Howie out in Philadelphia about those three picks that the Eagles have as well. So that might precipitate a move up in order to try and target somebody like Jamison Williams. Yeah, scary if they times. Don't get a, if they, as I say, if they don't get a guy like Jamison Williams, I, I'm, I'm just saying – I, I think that Jahan Dotson for Penn State is a first-round caliber player. I do not expect him to actually go in the first round. He doesn't have the height that the teams want to go for. But for a team as savvy as the Kansas City Chiefs, they just brought in a guy who is the polar opposite of Tyreek Hill and Juju Smith-Schuster. I mean, just his physicality, just get mm-hmm. him a guy who can go over the top. Miko Harbin can do that. Jahan Dotson can do that as well. He's a guy a lot of people are kind of sleeping on right now. To me, he is a guy that makes some sense as well. If the Eagles are able to move up for Jameson, I mean, I, I love what Jameson can provide. I mean, he we just saw what he could do. And if he is available to Kansas City, then sure. Then, then you, just, you sit there and, and make that selection. But if not, I think that they do have some kind of, you know, other plans that they can – take advantage of if that is is forced onto their hands so i think again the kansas city has put themselves in a position where they might be able to kind of recover from this shocking trade a little bit faster than a lot of people i think uh anticipate that they could yeah and a lot of times the one thing that really helps this transition having an elite quarterback which kansas city definitely has you know when we come back we're going to talk about a team that might not have a franchise caliber quarterback but they're going to build around this guy, and Rob Rain's going to talk to us a little bit about how they're going to do that in his new article. But first, I want to talk to you a little bit about Bet Online, and it's that time of the year again as college basketball heads full force into the tourney. Teams are going to knock off. My team's teams, plural, UCLA, Arkansas Razorbacks, they're in the Sweet 16. Let's go, baby. Let's go. All right. That is all upon us right now. And if you want to bet on that and much, much more, I right, know where to head over, man. BetOnline.net. It's the number one source for all your sports betting needs and information. BetOnline remains the number one spot for all of your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline is continued source for all of your sporting wagering informational needs, including, you know, you, know, you want to bet on the draft, who's going to be the first receiver taken. I think that's a prop that I'm willing to bet on. You go over and do that at BetOnline.net as well. They also have live betting and your favorite Vegas casino games. All right, head over right now to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action that's been online where the games start. Also, we want to thank you for making Locked On NFL Draft your first listen of the day. For your second listen of the day, we got Locked On Seahawks with Rob Rang. We got Locked On Chiefs with Ryan Tracy. And you already know, man, they got Locked On uh, football experts covering the biggest stories around the NFL every Monday through Friday in less than 30 minutes. It's free and available wherever you get your podcast. All right, Rain. We we always love to hear Rob Rain talk about a lot of what he has going on with these articles for Fox Sports. So you have a new one talking about what you would do if you are in charge of the Philadelphia Eagles. All right, so the floor is yours. Where 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 are the Eagles starting? They have three first round picks all kind of within, what, five picks of each other? Yeah, and, that, and that's the thing it's so exciting about, from Howie Rose from the general manager of the Philadelphia Eagles, uh, Nick Sirianni, the head coach, and, and what they are looking to do here, Eric, is that they, they do. They, they have three first-round picks this year. They have the NFL highest in, in terms of selections in the top 32. So what are they going to do? Roseman and Sirianni both basically doubled down uh, on the quarterback, Jalen Hurts, in the combine. You have not heard Philadelphia, at least not seriously, in, in the conversation for any of these quarterbacks that have been shipped around throughout the you know the NFL Jeopardy round that that we have seen in this offseason and, and so to me that's fascinating because that suggests to me that they are not very likely to take one of these quarterbacks could they take a Malik Willis obviously they, they could Kenny Pickett Matt Corral of course but that's not who I had them selecting. So I, that was one of the things that I, I'm excited to kind of talk about is I've been doing this little series with Fox Sports about just kind of 
taking a look at some of the big fish in the NFL draft. And that included the Seattle Seahawks. Uh, that was the article I wrote initially. Obviously, they now have the first round selections, um, the, the second round selections they have through the Russell Wilson trade. Then the, the Philadelphia Eagles now again with the three first round picks. Perhaps they'll be writing about soon. The Kansas City Chiefs. Now they have two first round selections based on what they just moved, made their move with the, the Tariq uh, or Tyreek Hill trade. You look at the Philadelphia Eagles, though, and, and the fact that they have number 15 overall, number 16 overall, and then with the their uh, selection at number 19 overall, uh, you know, I, I think that they really are in a position to make a lot of play in, in this year's draft class. I, I still look at this club as that if you are going to focus in on the quarterback, then you still have to make some kind of move at the edge rusher positions. I've been going with George Karlaftis, the, the edge rusher from Purdue. To me, his physicality, uh, I think it makes a lot of sense along that defensive line. Uh, and so to me, he would be a, a guy who makes a lot of sense as their first selection. Andrew Bruth, the cornerback from Clemson. I just love his physicality. I love the ball skills. I, I, I love the fact that he is still a very good open um, open field defender and, and, and run tackler, a run excuse me, it's tackler, open field tackler. And then finally, Drake London. If you're, if you're looking for a wide receiver, we talked about this before with Ryan uh, in, in the Kansas City Chiefs and the fact that the, uh, Kansas City went with Juju Smith. I think that Drake London is the exact opposite of the type of guys that the Philadelphia Eagles have selected over the last couple of years in their first round selections. Um, and, and London's ability to get up and steal the football to me is exactly the type of guy that you're looking for with a quarterback like Jalen Hurts. So to me, that is the three picks that I'm going for for the Philadelphia Eagles and how they can win the 2022 draft. And if you win the 2022 draft when you have three first round picks, then you were very likely to win in the fall as well. You talked a little bit about Andrew Booth, and does it worry you that he hasn't really ran? And, and I don't know if they know if he's going to run a 40-yard dash. A lot of times to me, your ears kind of perk up, your antennas go off. It's like, well, why is Booth choosing not to run? Will he be slower than what some people are anticipating? And would that be enough to maybe push him out of a first-round pick? I think they could. I, I don't like it when I, I see athletes who should – be running or not running like like frankly malik willis is as good as he was in his pro day in his you know combine showing i, I want to see you actually run i want to see everybody actually compete especially yes. a position like cornerback you know and to me that's a little bit concerning but at the same time what i've seen on the tape is that andrew booth is exactly the type of cornerback i think that the philadelphia eagles have been lacking i think that if you have a guy as good as as uh you know uh, Darius Slay on the other side, then you, you cannot go with a rookie from a small school. You, you cannot go with a guy who has not lived up to those kind of expectations. The fact that Andrew Booth has playing at Clemson, living it out, not trying, transferring as some other guys have and, and continuing to play at the high level that he has. That's what gives me comfort. But at the same time, if he does not work out at all, yeah, that I would be a little bit concerned. My replacement for Andrew Booth would actually be Trent McDuffie, the guy from University of Washington. I just wonder if the Philadelphia Eagles don't have a little bit of concern about guys drafted from the beautiful state of Washington, considering what they have not received from guys like Sidney Jones, from Elijah Qualls, from Andre Dillon from Washington State. He hasn't quite been the player that they thought. But still, Andrew Booth is the guy who I think on tape figures out exactly what uh, that um, that the C or excuse me, the Philadelphia Eagles have looked for in the past. Yeah. A lot of things to look forward to from the Philadelphia Eagles and what they do. I feel like, you know, their three picks that are right there in the middle of the first round is going to have a domino effect on the rest of the first round. But when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about some of these other guys that perform at pro days, what things kind of worry us a little bit, what guys excelled, even one guy, that Rob Ring just mentioned in Malik Willis. Stay tuned. All right, Rob, you, you just touched on it a little bit. And, and it worried you a little bit that uh, Malik Willis, he didn't run his 40-yard dash. So why is that something that you felt was a little no noteworthy? It's not that I don't 
believe that he is a terrific athlete. I, I absolutely anybody who watches the tape on Malik Willis, oh my goodness. I mean the lateral agility, the acceleration. I think Malik Willis can run a four four five in his sleep. I just want to see him compete. I, I don't want to see after you throw an incredible bomb for a touchdown in your pro day performance, as exciting as it makes me feel to see you walk around and you know slap the hands of your teammates and all that compete like let, let, let's see what you do in the 40 yard dash let's let's see what you do in the three cone drill I, it doesn't matter to me whatsoever i'm not going to change my draft stock of you of, of what you do in the three cone drill something i think is more important for cornerbacks for wide receivers for running backs than i do for passers but i still want to see you compete I saw a guy that went originally to Auburn, transfer out because he got beat out by Bo Nix. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's what I'm saying. It's like, I want you to compete. I want you to get nasty. I want you to get physical. And if you're not doing that, then you raise some questions for yourself. I, I, I think that Malik Willis is gifted enough. He should be in the conversation for if not number one overall, because obviously the Jacksonville Jaguars just selected Trevor Lawrence for number one overall, but the Detroit Lions are sitting there number two, and and they have some question marks at the quarterback position right now at Jared Goff. Why should Malik Willis not be in conversation seriously for number two overall or for any number of selections in the top ten, including Seattle, Seattle? at number nine Seattle, maybe? overall, be, be. Atlanta Falcons at number eight? I mean, there, there's so many teams. You should be out. It should be a slam dunk that you're in this conversation. But if you're not competing and, and there are all this talk, when, when you have I, – I, I watched his combine interview with a lot of interest because I, I don't want to hear one liner. And I thought that he was witty. I thought he was intelligent. I thought he was articulate. I thought he was funny. I thought he was genuine in, in his conversation. A lot of the things I want to see from a young player, especially a young quarterback, you got to be the face of the franchise. I thought he nailed all of those things. But I need to see that you're competitive when you're transferring from one program to another. You're playing at a, at a, at a, at a program that has Hugh Freeze, one of the more you know special play callers, in my opinion. Um, I, I just want to see that competitiveness. So it, it scared me a little bit that he did not do that. Um, and yet I do think that he is absolutely – one of the elite athletes in this draft class, regardless of position, easily the number one, the most athletic quarterback in this draft class. I think that just is obvious when you watch him on tape. That was my he... thought as well. And why would you be nervous to compete? Desmond Ritter ran great at the combine. There's no reason, even if you are close or your, your training timing is close, that you should shy away from that if you were going to lead a franchise and lead a locker room full of not college guys, but grown men. Like, get out there and put yourself out there. If you don't run in a straight line as fast as Desmond Ritter, that is not the end of the world. Like you said, on film, you are the clear favorite in that terminology. So I don't see any reason not to do that. I don't know what it means. And more importantly, I think at nine, he's available. I don't think anybody bumps him up beyond that. And maybe this is the reason why. Well, is he a legit guy for the Seahawks? And the, the, do you think that Malik Willis – fits what the Seagulls want to do because right now if you look at the quarterback situation for them it's up in the air I don't know if Baker Mayfield is a guy that moves the needle for them and they're going to move draft picks for him obviously they have Drew Locke that they got in exchange for Russell Wilson along with everything else that they got but like do they go into the season with Drew Locke at quarterback is, is that what they're going to do and compete in the NFC West with Arizona Cardinals with the defending champions, Los Angeles Rams and the San Francisco 49ers who were in the NFC championship game. Right. So it's a tough division already. And now it's like, well, Drew Locke is our quarterback. And I don't know if Malik Willis moves the needle, you know, that first year, but maybe by year two, he's puts him in position to where at least, okay, if they built around them a little bit. They use some of those draft resources and able to, you know, compete with the heavy hitters in the NFC West. So do you, you know, Rob, do you think that, there is a chance where, you know what, Malik Willis is a fit, and Pete Carroll, as old as he is now, he's a little older, still a guy he feels like he can build around quickly and uh, help compete. Maybe he sees a little bit of Russell Wilson in Malik Willis. 
So I, I think that's a fascinating conversation, guys, because I think if you're looking at uh, Malik Willis from a Pete Carroll perspective, then I know, know that he might not go with a quarterback who is a little bit more pro-ready. And to me, if you're talking about pro-ready quarterbacks in this draft class, then, they, then Kenny Pickett from Pittsburgh is probably that guy. Malik Willis has that type of upside. I think that John Schneider and, and most scouts – uh, would recognize that he has that type of upside, but that, that's because that's what scouts do. They, they are going to evaluate guy, what guys can be, and coaches are going to more uh, identify that what players are right now or they can make them right now. So I think that Kenny Pickett, Matt Corral, uh, you know, and, and Malik Willis are all of them play for the CLC except number nine overall. If we're, we're just if we're just drafting based on pure upside, I don't know that Malik Willis is available to the Seattle Seahawks at number nine overall because the guy has special athletic ability. He just needs some time. And I don't know that Pete Carroll and Josh Schneider have that kind of time. You know, there's a lot of angry people in Seattle right now with the Russell Wilson trade, Bobby Wagner getting a release in the, you know, kind of suspicious circumstances that he was. That's a whole different conversation here. But if Seattle feels like they have time, then sure, Malik Willis has that type of upside that you might be able to develop. If they feel like they have to compete right now and they want one of these rookies, then I think the Kenny Pickett might be the direction that they go. So to me, that's a that's a fascinating topic. We could spend an hour having a conversation <laughs> about if we really want to. I want well, to ask you both, and, and starting with Rob, so I think we all agree Kenny Pickett is probably the most pro-ready. Can walk into an offense, understand it, and execute some of it at least. Who's the second? Because for me, it's Ritter, and I wonder what you guys think. I, I'm comfortable with what I've seen from him. Uh, you know, obviously, you see the athleticism be put on display. He ran a tremendous 40 time, I believe it was an official uh, 4 5 2, uh, 4 yard dash at the combine. Uh, you know, you see some of the athletic ability when watching him on film. I know I saw it watching him at the senior bowl, but he also shows to be somebody who can make a lot of throws. Now, his arm, he doesn't have a rocket arm, but he, you know, it's a little. Dak Prescott ish, right? So that's definitely strong enough. You know, you're not going to mistake him for Malik Willis or some of these guys in the past, like Patrick Mahomes or or Josh Allen. But I feel like his arm is good enough to where, hey, I can make all the throws and I'll also bring a certain level of athleticism. He doesn't have as much hype as some of these other guys. But, you know, if you feel like he's the second best quarterback, uh, as pro ready quarterback in this class right now, I definitely wouldn't push back on that. I, I agree with you guys. I, I think that Desmond Ritter might very much be in that conversation as being the number two most pro-ready quarterback in this draft class. Um, I think that Seattle has got to feel good about what they have at the rod right receiver, at the tight end, at the, at the running back positions. They have the talent to be able to help a young quarterback be able to succeed. I think that's part of the reason why that, that Pete Carroll and John Schneider have, have you know felt pretty good about what they might have in the raw talent that is Drew Locke. Um, but at the same time, I also think that if you are looking to compete long term, then that's where Malik Willis really stands apart. To me, the fascinating one is Matt Corral. Matt Corral. I mean, just because of the fact that that he has the the talent that he has. I mean, he's it, it, it's difficult to say Pete Carroll, and Matt Corral. I mean, because my goodness, that just <laughs> sounds like something that that writers aren't going to want to say. But it, Pete Carroll has been kind of talking about this idea of a point guard as the quarterback of his offense. And he's been saying this for a decade or more. I mean, way back to his USC days. And you watch Matt Corral, and he does have that ability. He does have that long, lanky kind of build of a of a point guard. And he certainly distributes the football very, very well. So to me, that's why I think that – I hate to just say this because I live in Seattle. I think the Seahawks are actually one of the more fascinating teams because I would not be surprised at all if it took any one of those three quarterbacks. I'd not be surprised at all if they just said peace on the quarterback position, took themselves an offensive tackle or a pass rusher. I think mm. they are one of the true wild cards at this club. And I think that's exactly what John Schneider and Pete Carroll want them to be. I just don't know if they're going to win more than five games next year. But uh, I do think it's fascinating with the approach that they are trying to take at this point. I think all this stuff is fascinating with all the players that moved from one team to another, all the quarterback talk this offseason, the receivers, they're changing spots, guys making money, being the uh, highest paid ever and all this, that, and the other. It's been intriguing. We are going to be back tomorrow and talk a little bit more about there's something we didn't get into today. A Georgia or former Georgia player who 
has some issues going on, but he had his pro day, performed well. We're going to get into all that and more. Keep it locked right here. We want to thank you for making us your first listen of the day. We got Ryan Tracy over there at Rogue Analytics and also host of the Locked On Chiefs. So you want to hear more about the Tyreek Hill trade and everything that's going down there, make sure you tune in there. We also got Rob Rang, who contributes to the Locked On Seahawks show, and also myself, you know, tuning into the Locked On 49ers with myself and Brian Peacock. So that's going to do it for this episode. We will catch y'all tomorrow. Peace.